Hello. Okay. Um, thanks for sticking around. Sorry about the technical stuff. Uh, it will be great. Now, the great thing about this talk is everything I'm going to show you, you can just go download now and rinse the Wi-Fi and completely kill it for everyone else. Um, you can visit <laughs> our social media person is like, don't kill the Wi-Fi, please. <laughs> so you can physically go download it right now. So about half the people are going to leave right now to go do that, right? No? Uh, yeah, <laughs> some dude's already doing it. Um, also, this talk's going to be in English. My French extends to je ne sais pas parler français. And petit poisson. Uh, omelette du fromage. Some people are nodding, some people are serious. I guess it's still 11 a.m. and people haven't had coffee yet. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking for the next half an hour, 40 minutes or so, about the brand new uh, UI system in Unity. Um, it's going to be a very kind of like hands-on talk, so I'm going to do a lot of this in the editor. So hopefully, if Joe lets me, he can be like my microphone stand man, like this. Okay, this is why we brought him. <laughs> and he can sort of gesture and stuff like that. Um, it's going to be sort of like a ground up, so I'm going to have a simple scene with no UI, and I'm going to bring in world space UI, panels, sliders, buttons, all sorts of fun things. There's robots. We'll have a bit of fun with it. Everyone okay with that? We? Oui? No? <laughs> come see, come sir. Okay, cool. Um, so my name is Andy Touch. I'm a Unity evangelist. My family assumes that I'm a Scientologist, and I'm part of Tom Cruise's cult. Um, I still haven't really explained what I do to them. So naturally, they assume I, I've joined a cult called Unity. Um, so what I do is I look after Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I get all the new, shiny, sexy features from the developers and present it to the community and see how you guys respond. So if you're like, ooh, or you're like, ah, and kind of get your feedback and then pass it back to the developers. So kind of like having that bridge, show what you guys make to developers and show what the developers make to you guys. So kind of that guy in the middle. That's me cosplaying as Mario. Um, I have no idea what I was doing on the keyboard. I, I assume I was writing like a bug report to Unity saying, lol, lol, why does my Flappy Bird game do not work or something like that? I don't, I don't really know. Um, yeah. So whenever I give a talk, um, I like to, for example, find out more about you guys. So put your hand up if you write code. Oh, nice. OK, so like one or two of you then. OK, cool. Uh, put your hand up if you're an artist. Uh, some people are like, mm, Microsoft Paint sort of counts, right? Um, put your hand up if you're an audio guy. No one. That's incredible. There's normally one super bearded guy wearing a Metallica t-shirt at the back somewhere. Um, put your hand up if you have no idea what Unity is and you kind of just stumbled in and thought this might be pretty cool. So the person who works at Unity put their hand up. Brilliant. OK, cool. So yep, baby photo, cosplaying as Mario and stuff. So I'm going to talk about, about the history of, um, put your hand up if you use Unity. That's a good question. Ah, OK, so there's some people, OK. Cool, so it's going to be a very ground up presentation. So the history of Unity, uh, GUI, it has a very interesting history, um, almost kind of like, yeah. Um, so we have GUI game objects, that these currently exist in Unity. So these are kind of like objects that you place in your scene, and you can see them in your end game view of what your game's going to look like. So hey, look, some text. I should have put something French there, like petit poisson. That joke hasn't worn off yet, some dude's laughing. Um, but you don't really see it in your scenes. So it's great because artists can just drop in their, their beautiful art, but programmers had to pretty much script everything from scratch. It was a real pain. Um, on GUI was kind of like the other way. So programmers' best friend, because they could write, oh, yeah, I can script a button and make it position here, whereas artists don't actually see what they're making until it actually builds on the ends and click play. So you've got artists can drop in their beautiful art and have nice things. Programmers are like, what? Um, on GUI, which is kind of like, programmers are like, yeah, I can do everything, and artists which are like, what? Um, then you kind of had this weird one in the middle, text mesh, which was like a weird 3D, I mean, it doesn't look that good, really. Uh, so text mesh. So you kind of had these three sort of systems all not really talking to each other. Some are friendly for some types of developers, some are friendly for other types of developers. Um, so we started working on our own uh, UI system, which, funnily enough, as history says, is one of the most difficult things you could probably make. Um, some people kind of, uh, either were waiting around for us to make it, and they decided to use our asset store and make third-party plugins, so stuff like NGUI, EasyGUI, 2D Toolkit has some elements of UI to it and things like that. People were extending the editor to make their own UI systems, kind of like, Unity is making theirs, but in the meantime, come buy our UI system. And a lot of people are very profitable from this, um, especially NGUI and things like that. So those are all UI um, interfaces. However, at some point, we had to kind of like say, scrap all the old systems, and kind of make a new system, and kind of solve a lot of problems. So it needed to be both, um, Great for programmers to hook up and customize their code and customize their UI. 
great for artists to be able to bring in their UI and customize sliders and scroll bars. It had to adapt to, for example, all the mobile, desktop, console. Like, I think Joe could probably say this. Was the US UI made before building to mobile as possible Unity? Is that right? Yes. OK, so it wasn't really optimized for mobile. So we needed to optimize for mobile. It needs to be scalable. So for example, do percentages of screen sizes. You had all sorts of different problems, which is probably why it's taken a little while to make. Yeah, he's nodding. <laughs> he knows what I'm on about. Cool. So 4.6 and the future. Awesome. So no, we do not want to do an update. OK, so I've got a very, very simple scene. So this very simple scene is uh, just our robot lab. We have a nice robot arm as well. Um, and panel, and when we click play, it's very static. I mean, you have animation, you have weird light popping out. This is a beta build, by the way, so if anything funky happens, um, tweet about it as much as possible. <laughs> so she, yeah, she's not very happy. Um, so if anything funky happens, it's, yeah, it's because it's in beta and still in development. Um, this is the latest release that's publicly available, so everything I'm doing you can just go do like right now and rinse the Wi-Fi. So you've got particles, we've got lighting, we've got a robot arm that spins around. Now I want to add um, various different types of UI. So I want to add both UI in the screen space, so like an avatar in the corner, like a little robot's head, and he's doing some stuff, and he's animated and masked and things. And I also want to add world space UI, so UI positioned in my world. So put your hand up if you play Dead Space, or you've played Dead Space. Amazing game, right? So they do 3D world UI, probably the best I've seen in a game, where you go up to a door and sci-fi, there's going to be sound effects, okay? It's like, and it like folds out, and then you click a button, and it goes beep, 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 and it all folds up. It's like proper 3D world UI. So I'm going to do that as well. So both screen space, and it span around, and world UI, and how it all hooks in together. So the way that the um, UI system has been designed is on a canvas-based system. So you start off with game object to the top, we finally actually put stuff into subfolders. How long has that taken? He's nodding. <laughs> Too long. OK, that's the best uh, response. So we've got subfolders for audio and things like that. Create empty child. That's, uh, yeah, that's the best feature we've worked on. Um, and we've got UI. So under UI, we are out the box give you lots of kind of pre-built UI things for typical things. So like a button for clicking to open a door or shoot off a function. Um, text for some text, it's very obvious. Image, because you need to have it visually represented. Sliders, which I'll show you in a bit. Scroll bars, toggles, input fields, if you want to like, do like a login system or something like that. And event systems and the canvas. So I'm going to create a canvas. Um, and it will create this huge, big canvas that looks like this, which looks ridiculously large. So the canvas uses kind of like um, uh, three different types of options of rendering. Let me just go in 2D mode. You'll notice that we've extended the um, gizmos at the top. So we've got the little hand grabber tool, uh, position, rotation, scale. We've got this one, which is more suited for 2D development. So this first came in when the first 2D tools came in for, uh, to the, uh, the begin with. But now you can actually choose this for any 3D objects and position it in a 2D manner. So let's go to that one. Let's zoom out. And we've got our canvas. So the interesting thing about the canvas is if you look at the canvas properties, you have different types of render modes from the canvas in a nice drop down menu. So screen space overlay just takes all your UI, your buttons, your images, your panels, wherever it is, and overlays it on top of everything in your scene. So if you think of something like, you guys know Half-Life 2? Hopefully more people. Yeah, yeah, this guy, this guy is, yeah, he's, he's very happy. So for example, with Half-Life 2, you have all of your scenery, all of your enemies, and things like that. Then you've got your screen space canvas, which is drawing your health bars and your weapons and ammo and stuff like that. So it's kind of like the top layer of your UI. You also have screen space camera. So what this does is it takes your canvas and it kind of like maps it onto your camera on a camera of your choosing. So you can have 3D like panned out UI walking around. So stuff like um, like Battlefield or um, what else? Oh, okay, stuff that looks like uh, this. So for example, we've got the screen space UI with um, all sorts of like things on tilted out and stuff. So you have the screen space overlay, which is kind of orthographic and very flat, which is great for beautiful looking uh, UI. Um, you've also got this one, which you can do all tilted. You could have like a 3D, like you could have like an apple floating above like some UI and stuff. And you could do all sorts of cool, 
cool stuff. And the best one, this one I like, is world space. So this physically takes all your UI, just turns it into a world object, and you could put it above Joe Robin's head as a speech bubble, or you could put it, for example, above someone in the crowd here who has a health bar of how much caffeine they have in their system and stuff. So you could have world space UIs, like door panels and stuff. Kind of like dead space is everything is world space UI, and that's why it looks awesome. So I'm going to go to screen space and build up UI in screen space, and I'm going to switch it completely to world space just by clicking a button later on. You have all sorts of other things you can play around with, but I'll talk about them later on. So we've got a canvas. So the interesting thing you notice with the canvas is as I resize my game view in the bottom, the canvas actually adapts to whatever the screen size is. So this was a problem pr with previous UI systems, where, um, for example, you had to write code to say if your UI game view got smaller or bigger or it's on an iPhone or something like that, it would then scale. With this, it just adapts accordingly. So for example, we build to a tiny little iPhone, or you can see the UI scaling up and down to whatever screen size it is. And the way that the canvas works is you add elements as children of this canvas. So you kind of use the canvas to draw on your UI onto this canvas. You can have more than one canvas in your game. So you could have, for example, if you were entering into this room, you could have a world space UI canvas there, canvas above Joe Robin's head, canvas above my head, canvas in the screen space. You can have lots of canvases, canvas I, is that a word? Can buy? I think it's just canvases. Canvases, okay. I should probably stop like, trying to invent words and stuff. So we've got our canvas. So I'm going to go to my canvas. I'm going to create UI. And I'm going to create a button. So we've got a simple button that looks like that. So when you add the button, it already adds up a couple of things. And because the camera system is all in a child system, you can have your button, which is the back image. And then you can have your text as the top image. So obviously, as you move things around in your canvas, it's moving around in the game view as well. So it's very visual in that you can drop objects in, position it, and see what it looks like. Not like the on GUI method where you'd like have to kind of guess work and then click play and see what it looks like and go back. And not like this method where you don't see anything in the scene view. And this mo method, which was just a bit weird. Um, whereas this method, everything is all visual there. And you have it all nice and pretty. So you can move it all around. You obviously, you guys are probably very smart and used Microsoft Paint before. So you can obviously scale stuff, rotate it, and flip it around and do all sorts of cool stuff. So let's have this button. Now, the real problem with this camera system is different screen sizes. So a lot of people um, make Unity games for all different types of platforms. For example, tiny little mobile devices to big like 8K screens where they have about five screens across, like flight simulator nerds and stuff like that, um, to consoles. You have this problem with different types of screen size. So what you need to do is you need to either anchor your UI to a location or say, when it's at this certain screen size, scale via the percentage. So your UI adapts to different screen sizes. So what we have here is we have this big button. And I want this big button to be anchored to, for example, the top right-hand corner. Now, obviously, if I change my screen size down and build a mobile, my button gets cut off because, look, my canvas adapts with it. And it doesn't look too nice. That looks not pretty. I wouldn't like it if I bought a game and this, the button is rendered half off the screen. So what we can do is we can actually use this item um, in the middle, which our community is calling the power flower. Um, I'm not sure how our developers feel about that. I guess it looks like a flower, and you can pull off the petals of it. So this power flower is your anchor of where you want to position your UI. So for example, um, if I want my UI to be in the top right-hand corner of the canvas, I can just uh, select my uh, power flower and just drag it. Hang on. I told you it was in beta, right? Yeah. Um, I can just drag it and say, I want to anchor it there. I want to anchor it there. I want to anchor it there. And every single UI element on the canvas has this power flower. So the text, for example, is anchored so that it scales with um, the whole buttons. So for example, I could take this uh, power flower, and I could say, go to the top right-hand corner, and always anchor from there. Hang on. Doing this with a trackpad is not fun. So you can say, always anchor from the top right, and that's where your anchor point's from. So you can position a button like so, and because it's anchoring in the top right-hand corner, um, it will always kind of adapt from that corner. So for example, now when I scale my UI, I'm on a phone, it's always going to sit in the corner. So that's great if you have health bars and things like that. And the text um, adapts with the, screen, uh, with the button size as well. So I think the reason why our community call it the power flower is because you look at this, it looks like a flower. It used to be yellow, and they changed it white. But you can still get white flowers, but I haven't reminded the developers of that. Although this is being recorded, so they're about to see that I've just said that, and I've kind of dropped myself right in it. So what you can do with this flower is you can pull apart the petals, just like so. Hang on. Just like so. Just like. 
So <laughs> I got there eventually. And you can basically define a percentage of the screen. So you can see I've got, for example, I can scale my button by 50% of the screen. So if I had my button as like a big um, panel in the middle, I could basically say to my button, don't rotate. I could say to my button, be positioned in the center of the screen and kind of scale towards whatever that is. So you'll notice that it's using this width of the screen. So when it's a tiny little button in the middle, it will be that size. When you get bigger, it will scale up and down. Now, the really cool thing is you can also add, for example, there's a component called the content size fitter, which allows you to kind of like define how big that content is. So on a mobile device, I want a nice big button in the middle. But if I have five monitors across, I necessarily don't want a button going across five monitors. That's pretty ridiculous. Um, so you could, for example, clamp it at a point. You can say, keep scaling until you get to a size, and then stop scaling. So you can adapt UI to whatever sort of size you want. So I now have a nice big button. And if I run my game, there we go. We have a nice big button. I can click it, and it does, all, it does nothing, basically. So let's take my button, and let's sit it in the top right-hand corner, and let's make some UI. So as we have our canvas, we can have more than one element on the canvas. So if I create, for example, an image, um, we have our image like that. So I'm gonna create, so I'm gonna come back to my button later on, but I've got my image here. So when you create an image on the canvas, it uses the same spriting system as um, the 2D tools. So put your hand up if you use Unity and you've used the new 2D tools. One dude at the back, two, three, four, five. Okay, cool, so people are slowly waking up now. We. Oui? <laughs> okay, um, so it used the same spriting system. I guess that was because they didn't wanna make a 2D system and then a UI system, they use completely different types of importing. So how you'd normally import like a 2D sprite, you can use those sprites again in the UI system. It's all, it's all across the same thing. So you could have a sprite sheet of all your UI and all your images for your whole game and then import that all in under one uh, sprite sheet. So I've got a nice panel somewhere. Oh, crikey. Uh, Starcraft cat. There we go. So I've got a nice big box like so. So what you'll notice, you can do all sorts of things. You can change the color and toggle the color. So you can bring in your source image and then tint or tweak the color on uh, there. So you could, for example, bring in one panel, have like red, blue, green, yellow, pink. Um, okay, someone pick a color. Do you guys know a color? Red, right. Uh, this, damn you, retina. Okay, whatever. It will go red, okay? I promise. <laughs> oh, hang on, I could just like, use the, this color picker here. And... Okay, orange. Well, ugh, that's horrible. Okay, I'm gonna go back to white because that looks nicer. So you could tint your um, sprites to whatever color. You also have a slot for materials. So you could, for example, write, use a 3D material, 3D shader, or whatever material you want, whatever shade you want, and put it on there. So if you have world space UI, you could, for example, have your light, uh, have your UI affected by lights, for example. So when you turn on and off like a light in your room, the UI like flickers and turns on and off and stuff, which is pretty cool. And the last one is the type of image you project. So simple, just give, takes whatever the image is and it makes a nice big simple image. But obviously if you scale it bigger, that looks really horrible, right? We? Okay. So we, it just takes the image and it scales it accordingly. Um, you can preserve the aspect. So for example, you could take this image and for example, it will, change, it will take whatever the ratio is and scale accordingly. Um, we also have uh, sliced. So we have support for nine slicing. So if I go into the sprite editor options, you'll notice, actually you can see this a lot better in dark mode. Okay, so you can notice we have support for nine slicing. So for example, if you have a UI panel, um, you could, for example, maintain the scale of these corner points, scale the width on the side, on the top and bottom, and scale the height on the left and right. So you can have a panel and scale to whatever size, which then ties into the percentage. So you can have it scaling and you can always keep the corners. So you can see here, I've kind of cut out these corners so they'll always maintain. Um, yeah, so let me close that. Let me go back to dark, because that looks significantly better. Beautiful. So we've got our image. So that's sliced. Um, what we can also do is we can do tiled. So this will take the UI and tile it. Now, if I have a sliced um, image, it will tile the inside of the image. So you can have your outside border and then tile the pattern in the middle. So you could have nice, pink, uh, pretty pink like wallpaper in the middle tiling. Um, this image doesn't have that. So if I use, for example, StarCraft Cat, which is a huge image, 
you can see it basically tiles with this image over and over again. So you, and it adapts to the screen size. So as you scale it bigger and smaller, your wallpaper will go accordingly. I've now used a cat. So hang on, let's use this logo. Oh, that's, that's tiled as well. OK, anyway. So you can also tile it. Uh, that is ridiculously large. Right, OK, so we've got our panel like so. So there's a couple of things I can, oh, we also have filled. So for example, with filled, it would define how filled this is. So you could do health bars and power bars and things like that based on the fill amount. So if we go to like filled horizontally, you can do the fill amount, and it will basically auto mask your sprite. So if you had like a health bar, you could hide and reveal it over time, or like a ticker bar. Whereas in the previous like GUI game objects, you scale it, and it like squashes the whole thing, and it looks really like naff and stuff. Um, you could also do vertical, so you can scale this like vertically and go. Woo. Uh, you can also do this radially, so you could go, and you could have like a ticking clock. Um, I showed off the radial 180 to someone, and they said, "Great, I can now make a windscreen wiper game where you have a connect and you wipe it, and it goes like windscreen wipes and stuff." And I was like, "That's a pretty interesting use of a UI system, I'll be honest." Um, so you can basically manage, you could do 90 degrees from the corner, so you could have like a car power bar, like increasing, decreasing. And it just hides and reveals from um, that point. But for this, I want to use sliced. So I've got sliced. So the next one I'm going to use is text. So I'm going to set up some text. So if I set up the text as the child of the image, if I move that image around, for example, the text are always going to sit with it. But of course, I want the text to scale with the image as well. So we use the power flower. We just grab the individual points of the power flower and scale it up. I'm going to make that phrase fit, the power flower. Yeah, I'll try to. So you can basically have the UI position there, um, aligned in the middle. And then as I change the scale of the image, it's always going to sit in the middle. So it will always sit there. So someone, someone shout out something I'm, I can use for this text. How do you say robot in French? Ro robot? Is, is that just, that's the same. All right, I picked the worst words to translate. OK, robot arm. So with the um, text, it will write it out. But another thing you can do is you can do um, kind of like uh, uh, rich text as well. So you could write, for example, if I wanted robot to be in the color of red, because red didn't work earlier on, I could write, for example, this, robot arm. Uh, you can do it with bold as well. So if I didn't think that people would be attracted to bold text, uh, red text, I could be like, Old robot arm. Um, I think there's italics as well, maybe underline, but I'll have to double check that. So you can basically do inline typing as well, which looks pretty cool. So I've got my text like that. Uh, another thing I'm going to add now uh, to my panel, because my robot arm, uh, you'll notice that it basically uh, rotates over time. So I want to bring in a toggle that allows me to basically um, kind, of scale, kind of say to my robot arm, turn on and off whenever uh, the toggle button's clicked. And you'll notice I'm using the power flower to get this toggle to scale, hang on, um, basically with the panel. So if this panel gets bigger, the, robot, uh, the toggle will scale. Now we have this pretty cool. So if I didn't like pulling off the, uh, the petals of the power flower, I'm really coining that phrase now, um, what we can do is we can select the UI elements, such as the toggle, go to this little nifty little panel at the top, and actually define what we scale by. So what you'll notice is that we could do something like, for example, scale across the top. And it will automatically place the um, scaling. So if you didn't want things to be like slightly offset, you could instantly go to this panel, click a button, it will scale with it. So I could have it scaling with the whole panel. I could have it scaling across the top and stuff like that. So we have here, um, and I'm going to drop it down. So now if I uh, take my toggle, put it in the middle. Now if I scale my panel to whatever size, it will basically uh, always adapt and always sit there, and it will sit there very nicely. Cool. Right, so we've now got toggle, although that text is a bit too white. So when I created a toggle, it created lots of different elements. It created a toggle element. It created backgrounds, text. So you don't have to use this. I could go in and strip out the text if I wanted to. I could go into the text and say, spin. So what's the French word for spin? Is it spin? Uh, Le spin? 
that, that works, right? So what I can do is I can actually modify that. So you don't have to use the pre-built in. You can kind of create like a, a toggle or a scroll bar and then kind of maintain it or change it yourself and kind of tweak it from what it's originally made as. So I've now got that. Um, what I also want my uh, robot arm to do is as well as spinning, I want a slider to define how fast it spins. So I can go to UI, slider. I can drop my slider in just underneath here, drop it onto my image. Um, Take my power flower and uh, uh, stick it across the top, and then position it like so. So I've got my whole slider as well. I'll go through how this all hooks up in a second. I just want to position a nice panel. So I've got now got a nice simple panel, position it around. When I play, I've got my panel. I've got a button which toggles on and off, and I've got a slider as well. So now that I have this, I need this to now, for example, scale or change whenever I actually do something. So let's go into toggle. So under the toggle element, uh, you'll notice that we have lots of different options. So we have the type of transition. So when we hover over it, what, what's the feedback that the player has? How does it highlight? How does it change? I'll talk about that a bit later on. But the last thing I have here is this one. This is the magic bit, on value changed. So for each UI element, you've got a different type of value that it passes when you, when you click it or interact with it. So a button's kind of like a one-shot. It will go off and fire something once. So it will say, go and trigger this function once. Go and do this thing once. Um, with slider, it will send, send a value. So for example, with my slider, I can set the minimum spin speed will be zero, whereas my maximum will be 1,000. You could have an audio slider. It basically sends an integer or a float. Um, toggle will send a Boolean, so you can turn on and off different components and things. Input field will send a string. So you can basically send different things uh, very quickly and very automatically. So notice here, on value changed. And the way that you actually send values is through this event system. So what we can do is on Boolean, when you toggle it, we can actually say, go do this, go do this, go do this. So it's basically every button you can actually say, when you click a button, um, do 10 different events or 10 different commands or something like that. So what we want to do, we want to go to the robot arm. Now on the robot arm, I have, for example, a script called rotator, and I've got a Boolean called spinning. Um, I've also got inside the script um, just a simple function saying rotator spin when MonoDevelop wants to open. Um, so we have here, for example, a simple uh, function saying on void, toggle spinning, bool, and it will pass in that value. So you can either create your own custom functions that are, or methods that you can pass in the value that the UI element's using, or you could use a Boolean to turn on and off certain components. So for example, let's go back to our toggle. Uh, let's go to our robot arm. So you can drop that in there. So it's basically targeting the robot arm. It says, when do you want to run it? You can turn this on and off to test it. You can say runtime only. So I only want this to run in runtime. And we can say, now we have robot arm passed in, it's saying, what do we want to do send a toggle to? It's got all the components on the robot arm. So what you'll notice is if I'm passing the bool, I can turn on and off the robot arm when we click the button, and it's just passing in that bool value. I don't have to write any code. We could send static things. So I could say, when we click the button, change the name of the robot arm. So let's change the robot arm to, who's a famous French person? Daft Punk. Well, famous French duo. Okay. So we can do that. Um, let's also go to the robot arm. So we can drop that in. Um, let's go to, for example, there's our rotator method. So you could go into the mesh collider and toggle it between convex or not, enable the mesh collider or not. So you can just pass in and change various things. You could tell if it casts shadows or not. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. So go to rotator, toggle spinning, and it should do that. So now we run it. Um, we toggle less spin. It'll stop toggle it on. So it's basically just sending that Boolean through, and it's instantly changing it. And what you'll notice as well is we have Daft Punk. Not funny. OK. <laughs> cool. So we have that rotor to in there. So that's, um, that's toggle. So let's go to the slider. So slider is a bit more information. So slider, what we can actually do is we can set the direction the slider moves in, so what's the minimum value and maximum value. You can also set the maximum minimum value and the maximum. So you can set what the minimum and maximum is. So if you had an audio slider, you could do between zero audio and 100 audio. You could set things to spin either minus 50 or plus 50. You can set a maximum and minimum. So let's say minimum zero. So, um, someone shout out a maximum value. One's very boring. 2,435. OK, most people say 42. Um, 
I like to say 11, so I turn up the slider to 11. Some of you haven't seen Spinal Tap. OK. Wait, what was it? 2,435. OK. So what you'll notice is we have this um, slider here, which you can pass in. So we have the value. Um, if I drop this down to something smaller, you'll notice that it'll actually use a float, and it'll pass in a float. Um, you can set whole numbers. So for example, if you had like a multiplayer game with four players, you could do a slider to say 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Because you obviously can't have 3.8 of a player. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so 2,435. You, you look very adamant that I do this. So, so we've got this slider in here. So this, this um, arm, which is rotating at a speed of 5, is about to get very interesting. So now that we have this, you'll notice it's passing in a single. We could, for example, pass in several events. Um, but I just want to pass in Daft Punk robot arm. Open it up. So because we're now sending in a value, for example, I could go into if my robot arm had a light on it, I could pass in my slider value to be how intense the light is and stuff. So any sliders or any kind of values you have in the editor, you can instantly hook it up to do those sorts of things. So rotator, change rotate speed. Let's see what happens. Whoa. So for example, we have the slider coming in there. And if I toggle it, it will stop. Yeah, so we have the slider passing in. Everything might be OK. OK. Uh, yeah, so we have this, slide, this robot arm spinning very, very quick. I did want to do something where if it spins over a certain speed, like a speech bubble pops up, like help <laughs> or get me off this roller coaster or something. So we have this um, slider in there. So you can pass in all sorts of values to different things. Um, if you have any components, so if you have so for example, let's go to the uh, let's go to the camera. So if I go to the camera and I add, let's say, uh, audio source, and let's add also a wind zone. Uh, why not? And let's add a tree. No, a uh, navigation system. And let's chuck in a nav mesh agent and stuff. We have all these values here. So if I go to my slider. Um, and I drop in the main camera, you'll notice that it basically scales with whatever components you have. So look, we have access to the audio listener. We can change the volume of the audio listener. We can go to the audio source and look at all the stuff I can play with. I could change it slightly, change the Doppler level. So these are all the dynamic values. These are kind of like sudden values. So we, I could mute it when the slide is used or something. I could go to the wind zone and change the radius of the wind zone. So it's kind of all hooked in. I could have a slider to define how difficult my enemies are and things like that. So let's get rid of that. So I have my panel uh, in the screen space and my camera, which is now positioned in the wrong place because it has a nav mesh agent on. Oh, that, that would be quite interesting. Wait, OK. So I want to now take this screen space canvas, because we have this big canvas, and I'll turn it into a 3D world space. So take whatever I've done in this canvas. I don't have to rebuild it from scratch. I don't have to turn it into a prefab. I don't have to like, go on like, the asset store and download a package or whatever. I just need to toggle a button. So I already have a very nice control panel here. So my intentions are that this left panel here will go here. This right panel will go here. And it will basically, I can rotate that, and it will sit with it. So it's like actually sitting on it. The button's going to do something a bit later on. So we have that there. How much time do I have? Um, Minus four minutes, right? Yeah, I'd say 15. 15 minutes. Right, OK. So now that I've got my canvas and I've got my control panel there, all I need to do is this is some weird black voodoo magic. You just go world space. And my UI disappears completely. So if I'm in screen space, my UI is there. My world spice, my UI is there. Can anyone guess why this is? You get some free swag from the booth if you do. So everyone's going to put their arm up right now. OK, why is it doing this? So look, if I actually move my canvas, you can actually see it in the game view. And there's my text and stuff. So I should have actually left the cat in there, so I have the cat peering into my game. So the canvas is now massive, because all it's doing is it's just taking a canvas, which is using kind of like one unity unit as like one pixel unit, and it's now just blowing up huge. So here's a little trick. You just need to get the scale tool and scale it down. So you go, whoosh. so it's getting smaller and smaller. So I could actually leave this in my game like so and actually have my slider <laughs> kind of slicing through it. But this, is, this doesn't make any sense. I want it to actually be positioned on my control panel. Now, I've kind of cheated, I'll be honest, for time. I've already got a very nice little uh, empty game object, which is perfectly aligned and perfectly rotated to what this is, because I didn't want to just muck around with the values on stage. So what I can do is I can take my canvas now. I can name it to world canvas. 
uh, like so. Now I can physically take my cameras and attach it onto my screen position. So this is now attached onto a game object. Whereas before, the screen space is kind of sitting by itself. This is now physically attached onto it. It's as simple as that. So I now have it positioned like so. Um, I can do a cheat and reset the rotation. So now my screen canvas is now actually rotated to whatever the um, screen size is and the position. And you'll notice that I'll be able to scale it down and go shh, get smaller and smaller. And eventually, I'll be able to get to something like that. And then zoom in. I now have my canvas on the panel. Now, because we have this 2D option at the top here, I can actually just design and do everything that I was doing my canvas with the power, uh, with the power flower all in the 3D space. So I could, for example, take my canvas, um, position it like so, position it like so, uh, take my button, stick it like in this uh, area. So I'm just using like what the 2D thing was, but in the 3D space. So it's very fun to make all sorts of UI. So everyone's going to go away and make dead space now, right? Yeah, one dude laughed. He's like, oh, yeah. So I can take it. And because my, um, I've already set up all the scaling, for example, so my slider already scales with whatever size the panel is, I don't need to muck around with anything like that. So I've instantly got less spin, the famous French saying. And now that I've got that on there, oh, look, I've got my panel here, and I can already and stick it on there. So I could take this canvas and actually put it on my robot arm as it's spinning and then try and like slow it down. So that could be a game. If I come to Game Connection next year and someone's made that game, I'll take royalty. No, I'm joking. <laughs> we don't do that. Cool. So we now have our button like so. So one thing that may be a problem is, for example, when I have my slide at my robot arm spinning and I toggle it, I don't want the user to be able to, for example, change the spin. So I could just take my toggle boolean and turn on and off a whole game object using set active without having to write code. So if I go to my toggle, I've got in my separate slot, I could pass in my slider. So you can have UI telling other UI to do all sorts of cool stuff. Go to my slider, um, go to my game object. I could go to my slider and set interactable, which will basically tint it out, or I could just turn it off completely. So for example, I now have my Boolean, and when I turn it on and off, I have no slider. So if I turn it off, no slider, turn it on, and I can do that. As it's now a child of this panel, I could have this panel, for example, like rotate and do all sorts of uh, like really cool stuff and have my UI panel. It all just sits there as a child, so you could do all sorts of really cool, uh, cool things. Um, but next thing that I'm going to do is focus on the button. So I've got my panel. Um, I can do all sorts of bits and pieces, and now I want to do stuff with my button. So now that I'm my button, I'm going to go more into sort of the interaction, how you visually represent your UI. So what we have here is we have the image. Um, we also have the transition. So currently, it does a, you could have none if you're super boring and you want your game to be really, really lame. Um, <laughs> if, you don't, if you want your user to hover over and not know if it's a button or not. So I guess that's useful for like hidden picture games or something, or mist, I don't know. Color tint, which just tints it. So someone, oh, brilliant. I blame Retina. OK, take my, take my word for it. Oh, actually, I could just like do this to be yellow. No. Whatever, OK. So you can color tint it. Um, you, could, you also have a fade duration. So I could set this to color tint over, for example, the duration of two seconds if you want to do some iOS 7 style. So Johnny Ive is going to be very happy by this. No one? OK. Um, so I can turn that down. So you can do color tint. You can also do a sprite swap. So you can swap out the image entirely for a brand new image, so more like a flick book. And you say, show this, now swap this out for this, and swap this out for this. So I've already prepared a couple of uh, images. So on highlighted, it's going to swap to this one. On uh, pressed, it's going to swap to this one. Um, let's say, yeah. And then now what I can do is I could do something like, if I hover over it, it's going to swap to this image. When I click it, it's going to swap to this image. So it's swapping out the image entirely. There's no sort of transition or anything like that. And just to fit, make my UI fit in with the buttons of this. So I've now got one sprite, two sprite, three sprite. And just to, uh, I'll, I'll use the cat later on. So that's OK for sprite swap. Next one is animation. So you've kind of got levels. You've got no, no sort of interaction, uh, just a color tint, swap out an image. Next one is animation. So what we can do with animation is, can anyone guess for more swag what this auto-generate animation button does? It does, it auto-generates an animation, obviously. But what it does is it goes to Mechanim, the um, like animation system of state machines, 
it auto creates, so you can use Mechanim to animate your button. So you could have your button, so if I auto generate it, let's call it Le Button. And save it. So it's created an animation uh, state machine or controller, and it's created a separate animation state. And if I pop into the animator here, you've now got this. So it goes, it's got different levels. You've got no animation, you've got color tint, you've got swap out image, you now animate whatever you want. So for example, on highlighted, I can make my UI kind of like pulse eight out of it. So I'm gonna do that. So let's go to here, let's go to the button. Let's say on highlighted, um, let's say it changes, let's not do color because that obviously wasn't working. Let's change the scale of the button and let's say, let's go to the text and change the position of the text. Uh, like so. So you've now got this and I could, for example, have my button or my text like here. So it's gonna go and then sort of pop in and out. Let's say when it goes to here, let's uh, change white. So it's gonna go between there and there. And then let's make the button go huge as well, because that's fun. Or make the button spin around. So it's now got, when you hover over it, it's gonna do that, for example, transition. So you could have Dead Space where you walk up and it goes whoosh, whoosh, or, or scale bigger and smaller. I think, don't quote me on this, so this is something that some of you may try. You could, for example, in theory, you could, for example, maybe have like, maybe animation data, like mocap data, so you could have a character, and you hover over it, and the character kind of does a pose, and you click on it, it does a thumbs up. In theory, you could, I haven't tested that, so that's something you guys are all gonna go off and do now, right? Some people are smiling like, oh yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, so we have this button like there. And we could also set pressed. So when we push the button, let's make it go to like a scale, it's a scale of three by three by three, so it's a big button. So now, it's gonna do that highlighted, and when we push it, it's gonna go big. So we now have a nice big button. So kind of the point of that is it's showing that you can use our animation system, the existing animation system, and sort of do whatever, you're, whatever you want your button to do. And to kind of do it in the 3D space, you can make it pop out and do really nice stuff. Have I got 10 minutes left or five minutes left? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So now that we have this button, um, we can send off a function. So buttons kind of do one-shot functions. So I'm gonna, I have this canvas, so I'm gonna zoom out, and I'm gonna turn on a different, completely different canvas. So what you'll notice is I've got a world canvas on my object, I've now got a screen space canvas elsewhere. So I've now got a screen space canvas up here, and what I wanna do is I wanna have a character in that screen space canvas, kind of there, he, he could be narrating my character saying, um, pay 69p for this, I mean like, like go down this route or this is the tutorial. And I want, when I push the button to go to the animation system character and get him to do something, which I can do without any script. So the first problem we have here is I've got my canvas is masking. So I've got my background image and that's positioned like so. Um, and what I wanna do is I wanna have an image inside this. So rather than setting up an image which just uses the sprites, you can instead use actual render textures and just standard, uh, I think it's called, it's raw image. So you can actually pass in, for example, a, a texture or a render texture from a camera and stuff like that. So for, if I have um, like StarCraft cam there, any StarCraft fans? Of course, I can, for example, position my cat. Now, what's the problem here? The cat clips way outside of the image. I need this cat to be clipped inside the image. I don't want him to be cutting out. So what we can do is we can set up a mask image button, which looks like this. So if I turn off my cat, we've got a nice big blue image, so we can import in whatever sprite of whatever cut that we want. Um, let's turn that on. And if I go to my mask image, I can turn on my mask image component, so you can add this to any sprite, and then what it does is it cuts out all the sub textures. So now I have my um, StarCraft cat all cut inside there. So I have my cat and he could be barking orders like, increase the speed of this and turn it on and off and stuff. I can have my cat doing that. That's really boring, that's a still image. So instead, I could actually in, uh, go into my assets. Uh, I have my uh, head cam, my little robot, which is actually coming from a texture some, uh, somewhere else in the game. So I've got my robot, which basically looks like this. He's animating, he has an animation system that says when I send him like a trigger of happy pose, or whatever, he then goes and does something. So it's got this camera rendering this uh, character and the lights inside it, which is sending it to a render texture 
in my project. So I've got my little render texture down here, which is then going over to my UI. So there's lots to think about. So we've got this it position like this. I could, what you'll notice is that the mask image allows transparency. So if I turn on and off my uh, raw image, you'll notice that it's using the background image. And the mask image doesn't kind of like say, it must be like entirely white. It's actually cutting through. So I've now got my little dude in the corner kind of chilling like that. So yeah, and if I go maximize on image, it should sit in the corner and he's kind of chilling. So when I click my button, I want him to go do something. So that's really simple to do. I can go to my button, uh, which is here. Let's go to my dude called Rusty, or Lerusty. Open up this image. I can pass in my Rusty robot, who's got the state machine on him. Open this up, go to Animator, and this is where you have this list of all the fun things you can send it. Because it's a button, it's not sending a dynamic value. It doesn't send a Boolean, the button. It's sending a one shot. So I could go and I could change his speed when we click a button. So that might be quite fun. I could have the slider change his speed. So he's sitting there and he just like speeds up and he looks like he's drunk Red Bull. So I could set his speed to be, let's say, 20 when I click the button. So he's sitting there, speed. He's now kind of rumbling. OK, let's, uh, let's not do that because we won't actually see him wave at you. Let's select that. Um, let's go to the animator. We have the option for set trigger, uh, which is here. And hopefully I spelled this correctly. I didn't last time. Have to pose. So now what should happen is when we click the button, it's going to send off a one shot. And he's going to like cheer and stuff like that. So it's basically just hooking it up. So if you have all your different like animation set triggers, you can basically hook it all up. One last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make it snow. So now that I've got this slider, what you'll notice in the, back, in the far left-hand corner is we have this particle system. You could hook up the slider to define how much emission you have um, in your particle system. So let's go to our panel. Uh, we should have a slider. Let's say, as well as changing the robot arm, let's go to the particles. Uh, let's set the, nope, not that one. Let's set the, the fan. Now, we don't want this to execute in the editor, because if I change the slide to be like 2,000 particles, for example, and I leave, it's basically going to maintain it. So I can set it on runtime only. So when you leave, it will reset it to whatever the value was. And let's go to particle system render it. And let's say someone pick one of these. Anyone. I'll pick an emission rate. So now emission is going to really shoot out. And it's now snowing. We've got robots. And this robot's going to cheer because it's snowing. And yeah, so you basically got a slider that can hook into all different types of elements. So um, a couple of things. I've got like what, minus five minutes, right? Minus five minutes, OK. So a couple of things I want to highlight. So the first thing is every canvas has a raycaster. So some people are probably thinking, well, how is the cursor detecting when it hovers over it? Like, what, is there some weird like, black magic going on? So every canvas has a raycaster. So by default, it's graphic raycaster. It treats the graphic as kind of like hover over a button. It does that. On mobile devices, you don't have to script anything extra. So for example, let's say a button. Hover over the cursor, it transitions. You click it, it does a thing. Slide is the same. If I built this to a tablet, it just takes in my finger as the input. If I build this to a, um, for example, like Xbox, for example, you could hook up in the event system like what the input button is. So for example, you could say, when you push up and down, navigate to different UI. And you can actually visualize all this as, as well. I know I'm running out of time. Um, this seems to be something I do quite a lot. So for example, I could visualize when I uh, come into my game, I could say, when I'm on the button, push down, it will go to a different thing. So if you're on a, a console, you can basically auto-visualize, and it automatically pops around. So you can do stuff like that. So you don't have to script three different things for the UI. It works off across the bat, across everything, which is really cool. Um, so you use a graphic raycaster against it. You can also set up different types. So you could raycast against, for example, a 2D collider. If you use 2D colliders for everything and you want to use that, you could raycast against, for example, like a 3D collider. So again, if you have a door panel, you walk up to it, you could have like a 3D box on there and have that detecting the buttons, which is really cool. So I'm running out of time. Um, so I'll go back to my slides. So the amazing thing right now is you can download it physically right now. So you can go off, download it, play with it, experiment with it. It's in beta, so if anything, anything quirky, um, let us know so we can fix it. Although people are saying it's suspiciously stable, um, which is pretty cool. And people are already shipping content with it, which is amazing. Um, 
the, the demo project. So the thing that I have is just the robot lab that I've, I've, I've taken from um, the sample assets. But there's a whole demo project of all sorts of different types of interactions and things like that, uh, which you can play around with. The learn section, instead of actually got a whole, so you can download it right now. So we've got all the release notes, which you can look at, and it's, that's just for the last beta 21, which is really cool. You can download the example project, which is uh, you can download, see how our developers are making it, manufacturing it, sort of creating it, and things like that. And it shows off everything in the system. Learn team have put together tutorials. So if you think, oh, I get the canvas, that's easy, right? But you want to know more about, for example, transitions or a scroll bar or something like that, they have those specific videos for you. So you can jump straight into there. Um, the community, we have a 1,382 discussion board with all sorts of bits and pieces. So people asking in-depth questions, and our developers are sitting on there like answering them. People are asking, how did you do this? What is this craziness and stuff? Why this amazingness? So you basically have full discussion. Um, they did a UI live hangout from all sort of the technical bits and pieces. And you get to see our community managers and the people actually making the system are answering questions on the live hangout, so that's recorded. Um, People are already making extensions for the asset store. So it's not even released yet, and they're already making extensions. So here's like a quick way to make like, like graphs and pie charts and things. And you can plug in values, and it auto creates it. So people are already making really, really cool stuff already. And it's not even kind of released. And they're already making things, which is, which is awesome. Like PSD uh, to UGUI. So you download this, and it will just convert your PSDs automatically to the new UI system and everything, which is awesome. Um, the other thing in terms of going on with the future, OK, YouTube videos, asset store, future. So we're actually going to be eventually open sourcing this. So one sort of thing we're going to be doing in the future is taking areas of Unity and open sourcing them. So you can both open source them in the sense that you can take them, modify them completely, and kind of redistribute. So you can basically get the system and already dig deep into what's going on back end and maintain it. So we have a blog post about this and how we're doing it and things like that. So nope, source is available for everyone. Hooray. Uh, new hero, we hope so, so that's cool. So we're going to be doing that with the UI when it's um, released or like in the future. And in the future development, rather than shipping it and it's like, this is it, see you in whenever. <laughs> oh, um, there, there's a roadmap talk from Unite last year, um, our conference in um, Seattle, where the, they were talking about what they want to do post-release. So things that they want to, for example, after they release it, what do they want to look into? So I think they were wanting to improve text rendering to make it more crisper and more beautiful. And I think they were going to look into vector graphics and things like that. So you can both see, like, download it now, learn it, play around with it, break it, love it, share it, tweet it, whatever it is. People, MySpace it, if anyone's on MySpace. Justin Timberlake is, so that's pretty much the in person. Google Plus? No? OK. Um, roadmap, you can then do all that. I'm kind of way shot over. And that's basically the end. So hopefully you're able to see kind of how you build up slowly. It's way more depth than I showed. If I was to talk about the entire UI system, I'd be here for about three weeks. And Paris Games Week's only one week. So yeah. Um, if you have any questions, it's probably best to come find me afterwards. I'll be at the Unity booth, which is by the drinks and Nintendo, and Nintendo booth area. So we're well placed next to coffee and beer later on. Um, I have Twitter as well, where I basically Tweet Unity links, awesome projects, things like that. So you can always message me and things like that. Um, and I have email as well. Um, but I'm probably better to get in contact with Twitter. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming by. And I hope you have a great conference. And I won't try any more. Oh, au revoir. Um, uh, Monsieur beaucoup, très bien. Oui, yeah. So everyone laughed at the last what, French bit when I leave, but not. Thank you.